Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Welcome back to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. I'm your host, Paul Weaver, and this week we are beginning a new series that I'm very excited about, and I know that many of you will be too. We'll be discussing the life and writings of C.S. Lewis. In today's and next week's podcast, we will be focusing on the life of C.S. Lewis, but then in subsequent episodes in this series, we will investigate a few of Lewis's more theological and apologetical works. And to have this conversation, I'm pleased to have one of my colleagues, Dr. Timothy Yoder, in the podcast studio. Dr. Yoder is an associate professor of theological studies here at Dallas Theological Seminary. Dr. Yoder has been a professor for over 30 years. He teaches courses on theology, philosophy, logic, apologetics, and of special interest to us today, he has taught courses on the philosophy of C.S. Lewis. Prior to teaching at DTS, Dr. Yoder taught at Marquette University and Cairn University. Dr. Yoder holds a Bachelor of Science from Cairn University, a Master of Divinity from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, a Master of Arts from Marquette University, and a PhD also from Marquette University. Dr. Yoder, welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. Well, thank you, Dr. Weaver. It's great to be here, and I love the topic. I enjoy talking about C.S. Lewis. I think I've been reading C.S. Lewis almost as long as I've been reading the Bible. My third grade teacher read us his books, and I was hooked from that point. As I already stated before, we begin discussing some of Lewis's more theological and apologetical writings in our podcast this week and next week. We're going to give time to learn about Lewis's early life, events leading up to his conversion, his conversion itself, and the incredible impact that he has had as a writer, an apologist, a radio personality, and more. Now, it's not always possible to investigate the life of every author that we read. Either we don't have the time to do so, or access to biographical data uh, is limited. But when we do have the data, and when we do take the time to learn more about the author's background, oftentimes it's very interesting and informative to see certain life experiences that shape the author and influence his or her writing interests and perspective. Dr. Yoder, would you take a few minutes to share about the amount of data that there is on the life of Lewis and why this man's life and ministry has captured the attention and hearts of so many, yourself and myself included? Well, certainly, being that he's a 20th century individual, we have a lot more material than we would from somebody in the, in the ancient world, certainly, you know, somebody like Socrates or the Buddha or, or even... Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, there's just being that they are removed from us by a number of centuries, there's not as much material. But we have a lot from Lewis. He was very prolific. He wrote books and articles, and, and those are all available to us. Uh, letters, journals, mm -hmm. and a plethora of biographies. I think I've read about five different biographies mm -hmm. of Lewis, two of which I really like are by Nile Jacobs, the Narnian, and uh, Alistair McGrath, C.S. Lewis of Life. Both of them are, are excellent. And Alistair McGrath is the most recent, isn't it? Yeah, biography? I think it's about four or five years ago. Mm. Jacobs is from the early 2000s. Mm. And then there's Hooper, who was his secretary, mm -hmm. who just died last year, wasn't it? 2020, I think, of COVID. Yeah, that's right. He wrote something like 30 different books that he edited on Lewis, some of his own writings and Lewis's writings. Of course, Lewis's stepson, Doug Grisham, wrote a short biography of him. So it's very interesting with, with Hooper. Is it Walter? Walter, Walter Hooper, Hooper, yeah. He made it his life ambition, really, to keep Lewis's works in publication. He only really worked for Lewis for a few months, but it was in the last year of his life. He apparently did a great job because he was he became the executor of his papers, and he spent most of his career publishing essays and, and writing reference books, doing other sorts of mm -hmm. things to keep Lewis's memory alive. He's done a great service to all of us that love Lewis. A great interview I saw with him was with Eric Metaxas that discusses his experience with Lewis. Highly recommend if you're interested to check out that. I think it's available on YouTube and Eric Metaxas's radio show. Well, Dr. Yoder, where was C.S. Lewis born? What was his birth name? And what did his friends call him? Lewis was born in 1898 in Belfast, what we would call today Northern Ireland. And his given name was Clive Staples Lewis. Kind of a mouthful and not necessarily the most attractive of names. <laughs> There's a great story that when Lewis was about four years old, he came down to breakfast and announced to his family, I am Jaxie. And uh, from that moment on, he was 
Jack C or ultimately Jack to all of his friends. Lewis loved nicknames. One of the things that you see is reading mm-hmm. his biography. Everything gets a nickname. Houses yeah. get nicknames. People get nicknames. Books get nicknamed. Lewis loved nicknames. Mm-hmm. And it began with giving himself one. Mm-hmm. We may refer to him as Jack we over may. times during these conversations. But in our conversation today, we're going to rely heavily upon Lewis's autobiography. In this autobiography, Lewis records quite a bit of information about his childhood, his adolescence, and his young adulthood, all the way up until his conversion. The title of this autobiography is Surprised by Joy. And at the beginning of this book, Lewis spends a significant amount of time contrasting his mother's side of the family and his father's side of the family. And Lewis writes, and I'm quoting now, from my earliest years, I was aware of the vivid contrast between my mother's cheerful and tranquil affection and the ups and downs of my father's emotional life. And this bred in me long before I was old enough to give it a name, a certain distrust or dislike of emotion as something uncomfortable and embarrassing and even dangerous. Dr. Yoder, would you share further about this big contrast between Lewis's mother's side of the family and his father's side and why it was important enough for Lewis to include these details? His parents were opposites in many ways, although obviously they shared some things in common, one of which was a love of books. But his father was, in the British parlance, a solicitor, kind of a lawyer, close to what we would call a prosecuting attorney. But he was a man given to large emotional swings back and forth. He could be cheerful and sunny and happy, and he was a man who loved to talk. Lewis tells some funny stories of having conversations with their father and him scolding he and his brother and using the language of the court to scold these school-age boys. His mother, on the other hand, was very steady and calm. She actually had a degree in mathematics. She came from a more upper-class family, a little bit more wealthy, a little bit more socially secure, and with that came a little bit more maybe self-security, where his father was a self-made man, as Lewis said. So these contrasts between the stable, tranquil thinking side that came from his mother and the more emotional and storytelling side, I think both are well displayed in Lewis's personality. Mm -hmm. Lewis is a great critical thinker, a great analyzer, and a world-class scholar. But he's a great story, his vocabulary, all those things come from his father. And then there might be a third component, which Lewis says neither of his parents had, but he did, and that was his imagination, Mm. his love of wonder, his love Mm. of things that were magical or maybe transcendent. It shows up in his childhood in his love of animals, the talking animals, which we all know shows up later in his life in the Narnia Chronicles. So Mm. thoughtfulness, the critical thinking that comes from his mom, the storytelling part that comes from his dad, and then this tremendous creative imagination which is perhaps Lewis's unique contribution or unique gift. Well, Lewis had a very traumatic experience at the young age of nine about the experience he writes, all settled happiness, all that was tranquil and reliable disappeared from my life. There was to be much fun, many pleasures, many stabs of joy, but no more of the old security. It was sea and islands now. The great continent had sunk like the Atlantis. Please share with our listeners what experience this was that he's likening to the sinking of this imaginary island of the Atlantis. Yeah, he's referring to the death of his mom. He had a very happy and idyllic childhood. His older brother, Warney, play together, read books. Just a great childhood until mom got sick. It was cancer. They uh, did exploratory surgery and knew there's nothing they, they could do. And she lingered for about six months mm-hmm. and then died. And Lewis prayed. The Lewises were, were kind of nominal Christians, unenthusiastic Christians. And so he prayed, but the prayers weren't answered. And it was a devastating point for all in his family. His father particularly was devastated by mm-hmm. the loss of his wife and the two boys equally devastated by these circumstances. Uh, It was a major, major turning point in Lewis's life. In the aftermath of his mother's death, his father, being, as we said, you know, more emotionally uh, variable, did not handle the passing of his wife very well. He couldn't really deal with the boys, and his solution was to send them off to boarding school, which in hindsight was one of the worst decisions that could have been made. It set off a domino of events, a series of dominoes. And relating to that, the second chapter in Lewis's autobiography, he labels concentration camp. Tell us a little bit about this difficult period of time in Lewis's life that was so bad that he would give it this title. It was really bad. Again, he loves nicknames. He gives the school's nickname, one he calls Belson, just to kind of make it clear that he thought it was a place of torture and, and awful treatment. Tell us Belsen, for those that don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's one of, the, one of the famous German concentration camps. 
One of his schoolmasters was was insane. There was bullying, even abuse. There was poor education. He was separated from his family. The schools were in England, so he had to to go by boat uh, across the Irish Sea as a young boy with his brother. It was just a horrible experience. Lewis writes about it at length in Surprised by Joy, perhaps too much length. It's not a very pleasant period of his life, but it was deeply troubling. And we know, I think, perhaps even more than Lewis does about damage to kids who go through Mm -hmm. these difficult sorts of things. This man, Oldie, right? Oldie, That's his nickname for him, but he's sadistic. And like you said, I think two years after Lewis leaves the boarding school, it closes and he's put in an insane asylum. He's in an asylum, yeah. He was very unwell. And Lewis does make a note that there's no library, right? There's no books at this boarding school. It was an awful, awful school. He says that his father, who weighed these decisions and looked at dozens of schools and and somehow managed to make the absolute worst choice for him for the first school, calls Belson. So Lewis's father laid put him in a college prep school later after this. And Which was better. Yes. And it's during this period of time that Lewis loses his faith. So even with his mother's passing and even under Oldie, he still hasn't lost his faith yet. But when he gets to this boarding school and some influences of various individuals there, he loses his faith. One of the things that he becomes attracted to through a well-meaning female leader was the occult. He became interested in some occultic sorts of practices or beliefs. Those uh, shaped him in some interesting ways. And one of them was that it really helped to to remove any of his belief in, in a kind of traditional Christianity, at least for the time being. Mm-hmm. And so he pursued, he even mentions uh, immorality, doesn't go into detail. Some of the other biographies go into greater detail to that, but definitely a period of time where he doesn't even know who he is yet, but he's struggling through all these some very important questions. You know, where did I come from? Where where am I going? What is the purpose in life? During his teenage years, there's definitely, unfortunately, a deep dive into some Mm -hmm. significant sin and temptation. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, Mrs. C is the name he uses for this matron, right? Mm -hmm. And he has some very positive things to say about her. He knows that she's young and immature and she's investigating the occult too. But he says, no school ever had a better matron, more skilled and comforting to boys in sicknesses or more cheery and companionable. She was one of the most selfless people I've ever known. We all loved her. I, the orphan, especially. Um, even the people that he criticizes in the book, he tries to he tries to find some good things to say about them. You see that in his re- remembrance of his father, Oldie, and some of the others. He has some good things and some bad things to say about a number of people. She actually gets let go, doesn't she? I and, believe so. And partly related to her care of Lewis, it sounds like, that she comforted the boys too much or hugged them too much. And mm. A few other guys that are even less mature than her come and influence these boys in a negative way. Yeah, it's a cautionary tale to remind us that children are vulnerable and not all adults have the best interests of children in mind. And obviously we know this is a very much a contemporary lesson that we have learned and are still trying to learn, I should say, how to care for children and to love them and to train them without taking advantage of them. And Lewis was clearly one that was taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yoder, would you comment on Lewis's statement during his prep school days that uh, you just discussed when he writes, I was at this time living like so many atheists or anti-theists in a world of contradictions. I maintained that God did not exist. I was also very angry with God for not existing. I was equally angry with him for creating a world. The swirl of contradiction is really quite interesting, and it's going to take Lewis a long time to sort all those things out, well into his adult years, actually. I think that Lewis's comments about God, they make you smile, right? He's angry at God, who he doesn't believe exists, you know, for not doing the things that couldn't do if he didn't exist. I mean, it's it's silly. But it reminds me a little bit of one of the responses to the problem of evil that I observe Mm -hmm. in the world. There are some that categorically deny the existence of God altogether. I call this the logical conclusion that that if evil exists, then God can't exist. And then there are some that are a little bit more cautious and say, well, the evidence suggests that there is no God, but we can't really prove it. And so they're a little more cautious, not quite as dogmatic as, say, the Richard Dawkins of the world. And then there are those, and Lewis during this phase of his life would be there, that take a moral or emotional response, and that is that they would love for there to be a God. And maybe, in fact, they even trusted in God, but God has let them down, so they think. And so they are angry at him, and maybe even begin to think that there is no God, and yet the loss of this divine figure is so heartbreaking that there's 
a tragic set of loss. I think of, of Elie Wiesel, right, who went into the concentration camps, an Orthodox Jew, and saw so many of his family killed. And he survived and lived for many years writing a number of books, Night and Dawn and a few others. And I think Wiesel captures this notion of the emotional response. He doesn't, I think, really become a complete atheist, but he is angry at the God that didn't intervene. And so Lewis is in these shoes. Of course, together with that, he's also beginning to experience the feelings of joy for the first time, what he calls joy, these deep feelings of pleasure or of desire for something that is other and above, and it comes to him in nature, and it comes to him in some literature. And these feelings of joy are really important, and it's part of this swirl of contradictory um, parts of his life. He, at one point, he's very angry. God has dismissed God altogether, and yet he's in search of joy. And this joy, as it's going to turn out, going to be a very significant pointer to mm-hmm. the transcendent God who mm-hmm. lives. And of course, that's the title of the book, Surprised by Joy. Yeah. He mentions it many times. It's a very prominent emphasis in many of his articles and mm-hmm. chapters and other book messages as well. Stabs of joy. He Stabs of, of joy. Yes. But it's, it's always something that is very momentary. It right. comes very strong and it, and it leaves just as fast. And then he's looking for it. I was reading in Alan Jacobs, the Narnian, that said that Lewis kept a journal between the ages of 22 and 27. He would note every time he experienced it. And it was a constant, he was on the lookout at it all the time. It's always, but hard to keep. It would always be momentary. Yeah. And, then, and then it was gone. It wasn't lasting, but that, of course, leads us to what we're going to talk about in this podcast, where he comes to to believe in Jesus Christ, where there's true lasting joy. Yes. Finally, Lewis is removed from the college prep school and is introduced to the person that Lewis calls the Great Knock. Here's another another nickname. nickname. Yes. (laughs) Would you tell us about the Great Knock and how this relationship shaped Lewis? This is another important turning point, and this is one in the, in the right direction in some regards, but, but a challenge in another. This man, Kirkpatrick, was a, a longtime friend of his father. They had a very rigorous schedule of what rising in the morning and reading Plato and Homer and then reading Thucydides and then an afternoon off. And then later in the day, they're reading French and German and and some other important writers. It was a kind of home school. It wasn't a formal school, Mm -hmm. but Kirkpatrick was a great thinker and logician and he challenged Lewis. Lewis says in Surprised by Joy, for him, it was like red beef and beer, which is an English idiom for something which is really, really good. He ate it up. It was strong medicine that he needed to help him to cultivate the really powerful intellectual gifts that he had, which were not being developed because of the poor quality of his schools. It's like he compressed six years of high school or something like that into into those two years with Kirk. Now, the downside was that Kirkpatrick was a confirmed atheist. Mm -hmm. and uh, Rationalist. Yes, very much a rationalist, very much. Lewis was confirmed in his own anti-Christian tendencies mm-hmm. uh, during those years with Great Knock. Mm-hmm. In his childhood, at, when he was put in the boarding school, then the college prep boarding school as well, he was not challenged at all. He was bored. So finally, he's got someone that challenges him, and he's very intelligent, Kirkpatrick. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, he happens to also be a rationalist and an atheist. And right. So that exactly. certainly influenced him. The gr- smartest person he's met in his whole life is an atheist. Yes. But that's going to change. He's going to end up meeting people who he's also very impressed with, and they're going to turn out to be Christians, and that's going to influence him. And we can't talk about all of these influencers, but he was definitely a prolific reader and read some Christian thinkers. He was surprised when he read some books by Donald was one of them, I think, mm-hmm. and just amazed that a Christian can think and be intelligent and articulate. One of the things that, that we'll see in Lewis's story in his intellectual growth in the spiritual path is that there are definitely steps. Yeah. And one of the steps was to see that the kind of pure sort of naturalism or materialism that he was intrigued by yeah. as a teenager didn't hold up under closer mm-hmm. examination. That they couldn't answer the questions that he needed to answer. Yeah. And so he moved from that towards a more philosophical idealism and eventually to a theism. And you teach about worldviews, and a worldview has to answer all these questions exactly. adequately, right? And he's finding there's holes in the views that yes. he's... It can't adequately explain morality. It can't adequately explain beauty. It can't adequately explain human consciousness. And ultimately, it also can't adequately explain Lewis's feelings of joy, these deep desires that he has that are unrequited. And ultimately, he's going to need something that is transcendent to really make sense of those deep, deep feelings of joy. Well, Lewis became a student at Oxford University, 
In fact, his examiner that interviewed Lewis indicated that it was the best interview he had ever had. And Kirkpatrick, the great knock, indicates that Lewis was the best student he ever had. Anyhow, Lewis interrupts his college days to enlist in the British Army. He fights in World War I. Interestingly enough, Lewis doesn't write in his autobiography much about this period. You have to get that from other biographies. Tell us if you have any thoughts as to why he doesn't discuss this in his own autobiography. And then some important relationships that he developed during this time that will go well beyond his days in the military. So there's, I think, a couple of things going on here. First of all, Surprised by Joy is only about 200 and some pages long. You know, we have lots of biographies of people, Winston Churchill and others, that are 800 or 1,000 or multi-volume. Lewis was not interested in writing that kind of autobiography. So Lewis is selective in what he's, he really wants to tell the story of his conversion and the long path that he took to becoming a. And so he leaves out some things. Now, maybe some would say, there are some things that he didn't want to mention because they were too embarrassing. Mm. I think that one of the key relationships that you're alluding to, I think, is his relationship with the Moore family. Mm. First, there was Patty Moore, who was a friend of his in, in the war that was killed. Um, they had made a pact. They both had one surviving parent, and if one of them should die, the other would take care of the parent. Mm. And, of course, Moore was the one that died, and so Lewis went to take care of Mrs. Moore. And so Mrs. Moore became uh, a person that was very important to Lewis. Some controversy around just exactly the nature of their relationship. Towards the end of his life, he would refer to her as his mother, which wasn't the case. Some people think, and I'm inclined to agree, that Mrs. Moore actually became his lover when he came in from the war in, in Oxford. And, and she had a daughter, and they formed a kind of unusual sort of family unit. Mm -hmm. My guess is that when he started to write this book, either Mrs. Moore, who was still alive, or his sister said, don't include us in this book. <laughs> and so so he respected their wishes and didn't mm. include them. So Patty Moore, and he, as you mentioned, and they make this pact. Maybe it was kind of in passing, but Lewis took it for... Took it seriously. Yeah. I think also he was, you know, he was looking for a rental situation. And so and so Mrs. Moore, and again, this is a little strange, she is both a, a mother figure and a wife figure. And a source of conflict between Lewis and his father, right? To live with someone that's not your mother is very controversial back in that day, especially. Yes, it was. There were a number of, of issues between his dad and he. This is one, and Albert was not happy with the situation. Well, let's fast forward a bit to Lewis's time at Oxford, not as a student, but as a tutor, mm -hmm. and then later as a fellow. Now, for those that are reading that are from this side of the ocean, a tutor and fellow don't make a lot of sense to us. Would you explain those terms to our listeners? <laughs> Well, the whole British system is very different from the American one, and I must confess that I find it a bit strange. Uh, I would, I would love <laughs> would to you like to be called a tutor <laughs> even now. No, no. I, I'm happy to be a professor. <laughs> but one of the key uh, characteristics of a British system of university education, especially at Oxford and Cambridge, a student would be assigned a tutor, and a tutor is not necessarily someone that does some remedial work if you're not a good writer or bad at arithmetic. But a tutor was an individualized professor, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word. Word. And the students would meet with their tutor once a week, and they would come prepared with an essay that they would read aloud. The tutor would, why did you say that? What did you mean by this? Why didn't you say this? You know, and all the things that the great knock did with Lewis, this was the system. It wasn't just him. This was how all of them worked. A fellow is more, more like a senior faculty member that would be involved with. Lewis also gave lectures that were attended. They did not have classes like we have in our American system, but the education revolved around these tutor relationships and then lectures and lots of independently guided research for students. But Lewis's area was literature, right? It was. Not he, apologetics, not no, theology. Neither of those two. He did read philosophy at Oxford, and, mm -hmm. and he would have been very well prepared to be a philosophy tutor, but he also he spent a, an extra year at Oxford studying literature, and that's where he, he was able to, to get a position as a, as a don. It's important to note that Lewis was well equipped to be mm -hmm. a philosopher and a literary professor. He was, through all of his life, professor of literature, if mm -hmm. I use the American term, but his, he's somewhat underappreciated as a philosopher. That's starting right. to change recently, and more people are recognizing that many of his important works, like Miracles and The Abolition of Man, have a significant philosophical component. Lewis was no slouch philosophically. It just wasn't his, his major area of specialization. And maybe we'll talk about this more in next week's podcast, but he wasn't well received by some of his colleagues. Tolkien really was 
saddened by this because he had to go to Cambridge, right, to get a chair position yeah. because would you say his colleagues thought he's dealing with theology and apologetics? This is not where you're trained. You're not to get outside your lane, right? And not only that, they also thought that some of his writings were not the dignified, serious, purely academic. Mm -hmm. Too popular level. Too much on the popular level. Again, remember, Lewis was, he was a great storyteller and he had the great imagination. And if he had only written serious uh, academic works with lots of footnotes and citations, Mm -hmm. he was good at that. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the only thing that he was good at. Well, during his time at Oxford, Jack came into contact with some individuals, including a man by the name of Barfield, who convinced Lewis that atheism had major weaknesses that could not be overcome. Would you explain? Yeah, Barfield is one of his friends that he met while he was a student. Lewis describes their time together as the Great War, a year or more of debates uh, about all kinds of things. It was always in good fun and in in serious pursuit of truth, but it wasn't an argument, nasty sense of a fight, but it was an intellectual debate. Mm -hmm. And he began to see that there were these holes in atheism. Mm. And in addition to that, in addition to his conversation with Barfield, there was also the books that he was reading. And among the the books, he discovered that the books that he loved the most, we mentioned Donald and others, they were Christians. Mm -hmm. He read Chesterton. He found that these interesting people were Christians, and he was stunned. And these were little little chinks in the armor of his atheist side. But it was a long process of, of many thoughts, many ideas, many conversations, many books, many nights. He's in his 30s by this point. He is. He won't become a Christian until he's early 30s. Mm -hmm. Well, I love Lewis's statement in his chapter. I love the chapter name, Checkmate. He writes, really a young atheist cannot guard his faith too carefully. (laughs) Dangers lie in wait for him on every side. Please explain. Well, it it is a great line because it's the kind of thing that, that we as Christians say to our children and youth in our churches, be careful. Don't read those atheist things. Don't read that Buddhist stuff. Don't read that Marx, you know, whatever. And it's true. Ideas are important. Mm-hmm. And, and ideas, they have a danger to them, not being supported well enough. And mm-hmm. sometimes the, the dangerous things are, are necessary to, to sharpen and grow our faith. Um, in Lewis's case, it was his, his unbelief, his atheism mm-hmm. that was under attack by the Christian writers that he read and the Christian friends that he met, like Barfield, like Neville Coggill. And, and Tolkien is, is a really important one in mm-hmm. that context. In the same chapter entitled Checkmate, Lewis went from atheist to theist. Yeah. Lewis's conversion was not a quick one. It took time, and there were steps. He had to see the flaws, the inadequacy of a complete atheism, Mm -hmm. and move maybe to a kind of idealism in which recognize that there is some transcendent reality, maybe some non-material entities. And then, but that's not quite theism, although it's in the right direction, but finally he became convinced that there was a God. Mm Mm-hmm. But then it was some time later until he really became convinced that Jesus was the Lord and that Jesus died for his sins and and they became a Christian. Mm -hmm. It's interesting in in Alistair McGrath's book, he argues with Lewis's chronology in Mm -hmm. Surprised by Joy. Uh, Lewis makes it sound like it's uh, over a year, maybe even two years process. McGrath thinks that it was actually closer to a year that, that Lewis has some of the dates wrong. That's kind of an idea. It is interesting. A couple different biographers indicate some discrepancy in his timetable. He wasn't very good with the, the dates. times and dates. Well, another thing with, with Lewis, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, I think McGrath is probably right that his memory wasn't exactly precise. In the end of the day, it doesn't matter all right. that much. But there is clearly a case in which Lewis was convinced that there was a God. Mm-hmm. And so he had a time when he was a theist, mm-hmm. but not necessarily a Christian. And mm-hmm. then it was a year or two later. That he and interesting, a as a theist, though, he was attending church because he, he didn't know what to do as a theist now, but he thought yeah, I should attend a church, right? Yeah, well, Oxford is, is part of the, the English landscape for hundreds of years, and there was chapels, and he would go to chapel, and his colleagues noted that he was going to chapel on a regular mm-hmm. basis and found that a little strange. I do think it's a larger step to go from atheist to theist than from a theist to Christian. It reminds me of, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Anthony mm-hmm. Flew. Is he still alive? I'm not sure. No, he's he passed is. away now. But he wrote a book that's called There Is There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. He was a very famous atheist before the new atheist, right? He was. He was. He very was. An intellectual atheist, right? Not an emotional like Dawkins and others, yeah. Hitchinson 
than others. But yeah, he, Flew was a was a first rate philosopher. I actually read about him in my dissertation. He was the world's leading atheist for a period of a few decades, and he would debate Christian thinkers, William Lane Craig, Gary mm-hmm. Habermas, and others. I saw him in debate when I was in grad school in the nineties. But he surprisingly, because of intelligent design and some of the other evidence that he saw came to believe that there was a God. It's a very interesting story and does parallel Lewis's because Lewis's spiritual conversion took place in stages. Mm. Lewis's went further than Flew ever did, right. much further. So, so as far as we know, Flew never came to faith in Christ and so. is in the Christless eternity. So it's still an important step to become theist, but it's not sufficient. It's, it's, not, the, it's not the prize. Yeah. J.R.R. Tolkien was a colleague of Lewis's and a close friend. Would you share with us a little bit about his influence? He's very famous as well as an author. His influence on Lewis prior to and leading up to his conversion. So both Tolkien and Lewis were on the same faculty together. What we will call an English department. They would have a different name for it. But they were, and they were both had a similar specialization, medieval literature and interest in myth. But Tolkien was Catholic and was confessed Christian, and Lewis was not. There's a famous night when they walked Addison's Walk mm-hmm. all night long talking about all these things. One of the ways to explain what they were talking about was that they both had this strong belief in myth. Mm-hmm. In, in our world, a lot of times myth is just, well, a false story or a fairy tale or something that is inconsequential, just a, a silly story. But for both Tolkien and Lewis, myth was something much different. It, it wasn't necessarily true, but it was a story that contained very strong philosophical ideas about human nature, about the world, about the way things were. The myths were very important for ways of thinking about how the world was, how do we respond to problems, how to develop character, how to overcome evil, and so on. And they were they were incredibly important. And one of the things that helped Lewis move from just being a theist to being a Christian was he realized that Christianity was the true myth. Mm. It was a, it was this really important story that also happened to be true. It was it had historicity. It, it really took place. Jesus was a real person and and he really died and really rose from the dead. That was part of the conversation of this night. And it wasn't like Lewis knelt down on the ground and prayed. It was sometime later he tells this interesting story of a trip to the zoo. Yeah. <laughs> and when he came back from the zoo, he was a Christian. It's, 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 it's a little strange. But I think it was one of those things where he just, the pieces finally all connected yeah. together. Like when you do a jigsaw puzzle, it wasn't a big dramatic finish, but the pieces had been shaping and forming and moving together. And they finally converged. Yeah. And he realized, you know what? I'm a Christian. This is what I believe. This is what I really believe after years of reflection. I believe Mm. that Jesus is the Son of God. Mm. And Tolkien is most famous for the Lord of the Rings, for those that maybe don't know his name. And we see some of the influence with Tolkien. So Mere Christianity Lewis is going to try to say, okay, what's common to all of Christendom, really? That's right. right? Yes. And Tolkien wanted Lewis to become Catholic. Mm -hmm. That was a source of a little bit of... uh, contention there too, right? They didn't always agree. It's one of the great friendships of the 20th century, intellectually mm-hmm. speaking, because of the, the really significant output of both of them and the role that each played in mm-hmm. the other becoming the massively influential and successful writers that they are. Yeah. And another teaser for next week, uh, there's another controversial relationship that comes into Lewis's life that causes a little bit of a rift between uh, Tolkien and Lewis. Mm-hmm. In the final chapter of Lewis's autobiography called Surprised by Joy, Lewis discusses his conversion experience. Are there any more details you want to share about that? There's a famous line in which he says he's in his rooms at Oxford. He kneels down and he recognizes that Jesus is God. He says, I was the most reluctant convert in yeah. all of England. That always bothered me when I, when I read that because most people, when they become Christians, it's joy and it's freedom from sins and or finding your way. It's being connected with God in a way you've never been. I think what Lewis meant was that because of the baggage of his youth, he did not want to be, he did not want to be a follower of God. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to be his own person. But gradually, sometimes even against his will, he recognized that that there was a God. And then he recognized that Jesus was God who died for his sins. And at that moment, he had to give up this Mm self-sufficiency. And that's the reluctance, I think. But once he becomes a Christian, almost overnight, 
he becomes a Christian leader, writing these three tremendous books and joining the fray of apologetics and evangelism. Mm. And so if there was reluctance on that first night, it doesn't seem to show up again. He's, he's ready to, to take up the mantle of defending the faith. Yeah, and there's a biography called The Most Reluctant Convert, right? By Downing, I think yes. I have on my yes. shelf back there. Uh, but within 10 years, he's already writing very influential and preaching, speaking very influential. Absolutely. Apologetical and theological writings. Well, our time is up for today's program, but I do hope that you'll join Dr. Yoder and myself again next week as we continue our conversation about the life of C.S. Lewis. In next week's podcast, we will discuss the life of C.S. Lewis after his conversion. We'll discuss the incredible impact that Lewis had and the very intriguing life that he lived. You won't want to miss it. If you enjoyed today's program, please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a positive review on whatever podcast platform you use. These actions will help our program become more accessible to those who are searching for faith-building programming. But until next time, never forget, Bible and theology matters, because what you believe determines how you behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.